<laughs> I don't do that. But no, no, it's become, I don't know why or how, but it's become our trademark. It just okay. happened. She it started just happened. it. I started it. I know. I started it. It just, it was just one of those moments, you know, and now it's become our trademark. Yep. Yep. Bizarre. Hi, everybody. My name is Karen Boyty, and I am part of the Ontario Autism Coalition. And I'm here with Harvey Bischoff and Laura Kirby McIntosh. So from time to time, we do these Facebook Lives. We um, have a very vibrant and fascinating Facebook page mm -hmm. with a lot of debate, a lot of topics. And these Facebook Lives are an attempt to take some of the discussions from our page and put them into a longer format. Mm -hmm. uh, please feel free to uh, type in and add add your two cents as we go along. I have a number of pre-submitted questions from our membership and uh, we're just going to push on. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's rush hour, right? Yeah. So we're not going to, we're likely not going to have a lot of people watching live. We are here with the president of OSSTF. That's my union. That's, that's Laura's union. We're going to talk about high school issues today and what's going on in the province and let's just go. Hey, yeah. Hey, so Harvey, so who the heck are you? Um, as you said, I'm the president of OSSTF. I can add to that if you yeah, want. Yeah, please. What would, what, would you, what would you like me to add? Well, um, okay. Look, so, I've, I've, how's this? I've been uh, I'm 29 years in education now. I yeah. spent uh, I spent a number of years as a classroom teacher before I got involved with the union, um, and I'm now in my 12th year working out of the provincial office, um, just finishing my second year as president. Simple question. What's a union? So uh, it is it is a designated under law. It's the bargaining agent for a group of members. So that means that we have the right under law to negotiate collective agreements and uh, not just the right, but the duty to represent our members. So um, it, it comes with responsibility as well. Um, we can't decide, for example, that a member isn't worth representing. They are members of our union and we have an obligation under law to represent them. So if you don't like them, it doesn't matter. In fact, that would be uh, not representing them if you don't like them would be considered bad faith. Um, so we're not allowed to act in a way that's arbitrary, discriminatory, or in bad faith. Um, our job is to represent our members um, when they require that representation. And OSSTF represents? So uh, despite our name, Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation, we represent uh, not only teachers. So first of all, we represent uh, all of Ontario's English public high school teachers. Okay. Um, so the, the Francophone teachers, the Catholic teachers are represented by other unions. The elementary teachers are represented by another union. Um, but on top of those teachers that we represent, uh, which we represent by law, the, the uh, Education Act says that these members belong to us. Mm -hmm. We also organize, so, so other members, um, non-teacher members, support staff, choose to join OSSTF. So about a third of our membership, in fact, is support staff from early childhood educators through um, all sorts of other positions within the, the elementary and secondary systems, EAs, office clerical, um, uh, custodial, um, professor, professional designations, psychologists, psychometrists, uh, speech and language pathologists, those sorts of, uh, of uh, jobs as well. Um, and we even represent the support staff in six universities in Ontario. Okay, because when we talked to, to Fred Hahn, he had said that um, he, they represent EAs, yes. they represent custodians. So this is confusing. Right. So who, who, who is where? So, so we represent the where wherever uh, a group of, for example, EAs chose to join OSSTF, we represent them. So we represent um, the EAs in in particular school boards, um, okay. and, and so so the EAs who work for a particular employer that have chosen to join us will represent. Same for some custodial groups and and so forth. Right. And how many school boards do we have, Laura? Seventy-two. Seventy-two school boards. How many people are in this union? So we're close to 70,000. About two thirds of those are, are those secondary teachers that I described and the other third are support staff. Question, if, if I wanted to know whether the EAs in my school board belonged to OSSCF or QB or another union, how would I find out? 
Um, you should be able to ask your board. You should actually even find it on your board website. In okay. most cases, there will be a, the board website will have a link to um, the unions that represent the different members. Cool. Or, or you could ask me. Or we could ask you. Okay, <laughs> let me ask you this. You were a teacher yes. before you had this big job. That's right. So what did you do as a teacher? How uh, long did you do it? So I was, for the most part, I was a high school teacher. For the most part, I taught English. Okay. Um, from grade nine up to back in the days when we had OAC. Okay. Um, which is not our OAC. Different not OAC. Your, not your, yeah. uh, ex indeed, the Ontario <laughs> Academic Credits, uh, which right? was sort of the, the grade 13 replacement. Um, and I did that for 12 years um, and then uh, found myself uh, as the chief negotiator in Durham, uh, which was a full-time release position. So at that point, I spent five years in my local office um, and then the subsequent 12 years here. How do you get to be the press? How do you get the, the big job here? You get elected. You get elected. You get elected. So, so while um, some um, premiers refer to us as union bosses, um, and other uh, things. And other things. Yeah. Bosses um, tend not to be elected. Bosses are appointed. Mm -hmm. um, I'm. I'm. Uh, I'll call myself a union leader because I've been elected at. We hold elections at our annual meetings, so it is delegates. It's a delegated election. There's uh, close to 600 delegates at our annual meeting who select yeah. the members of the. Is executive. there is there a term for your position? It's um, it's a two-year term. A two-year yeah. term. Yeah. Okay. Laura, you look like you want to ask something. No, I'm good. No, you're good. Okay. Um, hey, Amanda. Hi, Amanda. Can uh, can people hear us? By the way, uh, give us somebody. Give us an amen. Because our microphone is quite a long way from us. Give and, us a thumbs uh, up if the volume's okay, up, and an angry if it's not. An angry. I don't know. <laughs> Have you ever worked with kids who are autistic or special needs kids as a teacher? Yeah, so I was I I, I can recall only it, it, it's I mean it's shocking when I think about it now. I can recall one student in a grade 10 class that I taught who was um, on the autism spectrum and I don't believe that I taught a single other autistic kid. Mm. Okay. So can, yeah. can I tell you a secret? Yeah. You probably did. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, no no. <laughs> right? no, no but I, but yeah. often they're not identified or or you don't know. And I, I, the other thing that I find curious as, as a high school teacher is that when I have a student with an IEP, often the information I get is very vague. So I will get an IEP that says this student has a communication disorder and I have no idea what that disorder is. I don't know whether it's autism, dyslexia, AD, like I don't know whether it's a nonverbal learning disability. I, I don't get the specific diagnosis. Mm. And I have no idea why. Is I mean, that... I, I can go look in their Ontario student record, right? which is the file that follows every kid around to all yeah. the schools that they go to and has all their report cards and assessments and, and, and letters and notices and that kind of stuff. Um, but it's not, I, I don't automatically know if a student has autism. It's only recently that I've noticed at my school that um, that they found a very discreet way of, of identifying there's a particular keystroke that they'll use. Um, but that's that's only in the last sort of four or five years. So Laura, yeah. you are our leader at the OAC. I am. You also happen to be a high school teacher. I am. Uh, you're an autism mom. Can you tell me how are most high school teachers hired and assigned the curriculum that they teach? So to get a full-time contract position is quite a journey. Um, so you start off by, a, and correct me if I get any of this wrong, by the way, because I've kind of been in the classroom for 25 years, so it's, it's a while since I've gone through the process. Yeah. But you start by applying for a position with the board, and if you're lucky, you, you begin by supply teaching. And you'll do that for several months, sometimes a few years. Um, once you've been supply teaching for a certain amount of time, then you can apply for long-term occasional contracts, which is when you're covering for somebody, you're kind of like a supply teacher, but you're there long-term. So like if somebody is off on a maternity leave or if, um, if somebody is off on a sick leave, you're covering maybe for a semester or for a full calendar year. And then at the end, that teacher comes back and you're back to looking for your next gig. Um, a, a colleague of mine, went from supply teaching to LTO contracts 
and bounced from school to school to school for seven years before getting an actual contract. Um, and it's only at that point that you get a, a contract and, and you're assigned to a school mm -hmm. and that's a, that's a permanent position. Then in terms of, of what you teach, it's based on your qualifications. So I went to university and studied history and English and French and, and politics. I got my qualifications in, in some of those. And I am in theory only supposed to teach those subjects. So a principal can't come along and say, hey, Laura, why don't you teach math? A, because that would be a phenomenally stupid idea. Um, and B, I'm not qualified for it. In some cases, though, a principal might say, all right, you studied history and English and French. You're not qualified for politics, but would you like to teach civics? And we can sign a mutual consent form um, that's called a letter of permission from the minister or something like yeah. that. It's, it's, it, there is no necessary form for that. Yeah. You just have to provide consent. Yeah. So I may agree in some cases to teach a course that technically I don't have the qualifications for, but I may have experience, say in the in the workforce or or, or otherwise. So how is it that someone becomes a special education teacher? Well, they actually have to take um, special qualifications for that. So when you go through teachers college, you get your your base teaching certificate, and if you're a secondary teacher, then you qualify to teach two subject areas. So I went in and, and qualified for history and English. But education, of course, is never done. So if you want to become um, qualified to teach another subject, all you have to do is take an additional course. You can do these online. You can do them in the summer. You can do them in person during the year. And it's offered from a university. And you take that course. And then at the end, you're, you're qualified to teach that. So special education. Um, you can, I don't know if you can certify for it in teacher's college or is it, is it only an ABQ or can you go through teacher's college for spec ed? I don't think you can. I'm not, a, I, no, not by itself. Not, no. I don't believe so. Although you could, I believe you can come out with, you would have your, your, uh, two courses if you're a secondary, you mm -hmm. know, a senior, uh, intermediate senior teacher, you'd have the two courses you're qualified in. I think you can get at least part one of spec ed through. Yeah. The faculty of education at least in some cases so. but it's been some time for me and well and I know this has come up in in some of our lobbying in, um, and also come up through the the work of the children's advocate with his group about um, about students with disabilities because they first put forward the recommendation and then we endorsed it that every teacher should have to have the equivalent of special education part one that it should be integrated into Teachers College, especially now that Teachers College is a two-year program and not just a one-year program. So there is technically time, but it has to do with with normalizing special education. Um, because if one, I, I've, I've heard the stat, one in six students have some kind of ex exceptionality, well then that's not special at all. Like the whole phrase special education is, is wrong, it's normal education. Um, but that's just sort of that's, that's opinion and, and, and recommendations. Whether or not we'll, we'll get mm -hmm. there, I don't know. Um, Harvey, do you have a sense of how many teachers who are working in special education classes have access to that training? If they're working in a special education class, they've access they, that they training. They have to have yes. it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, when Laura was talking earlier about that mutual consent clause, mm -hmm. um, that's the clause by which I taught math once. Um, oh wow! Because, uh, Lucky because, you. Uh, no, I was interested in it, and there was cool. uh, there was a spare section, and and uh, and I have some university calculus, algebra, and stuff like that. Even though my degree is in English, <laughs> um, but I enjoyed it a lot. In fact, that was the class in which I had the uh, the young lady with autism, um, oh, cool. who, where I also had a, a, a brilliant TA, um, which uh, assigned to that assigned student. To that student oh, cool. Yes, okay. which made. Uh, everything worked extremely well. Nice. This is clearly not always the case. No. Um, but anyway, so but it, it's, there are a couple of areas. Uh, for example, you cannot teach a technology class, like let's say an auto shop, mm, unless okay. you're because of safety issues. Right. right. Special education okay. uh, is a kind of course where you need to have the, uh, the uh, qualification. Okay. So uh, many parents have sent us pre-submitted questions. Mm -hmm. The laptop's very far away from us, so I will try to get up there and read your questions live as well. Mm. Um, it's going to be a little bit 
bumpy, so I apologize. I, um, I can see a couple. Laura that, can see some questions. Yeah. I'm going to want you read to yourself very quietly, behave yourself. And uh, I'll start with the first question, shall I? Sure. Okay, so Harvey, what sort of advocacy is the Federation, this is from Louise, uh, doing to get small academic classes for students with ASD in our high schools? Students shouldn't have to choose between large, loud class classes or life skills. The bullying in our high schools can be horrific from both students and staff. So I'd say, it, I mean, we are advocating for having the appropriate supports for all the students in the schools. Um, where that would be uh, a smaller academic class for students for, for whom that is the, uh, the best uh, environment for them in order, to, in order to succeed, then we can advocate for that as well. Um, we've been, um, this has been a long time mission of ours to try to make sure that the school system has the supports that all kids need in it. Um, and we have made some significant advances over the years and in fact, if you look at you know something something like graduation rates, the fact that we're had a 20% improvement in graduation rates between 16, 17 years ago and now tells you that I think we've had some success in providing all different kinds of students with different kinds of supports that allow them to succeed in, in different kinds of classrooms. Unfortunately, right now we are under pressure to um, you know to to even maintain what we have. In fact, there's a significant push from government to go backwards in that where classes will go up uh, in size enormously. Mm -hmm. um, average class sizes will go up and the ability to protect a small program when your average class size goes up to mm -hmm. 28 to 1 um, is so vastly diminished that it causes us great concern. So we will we'll continue to advocate um, mm -hmm. for this, but people have to be aware that Right now, it's it is a distinctly uphill battle mm -hmm. because of, of government policy announcements. Laura, I'm aware that I'm punching very high above my weight here. Okay. I just have a nine year old, mm -hmm. so I want to ask you good questions, but um, I'm not sure where I'm headed. <laughs> That's not a great thing for an interviewer to say. But uh, I hear a lot of people talking about two streams mm -hmm. in high school. Right. So if you have a disability, a learning disability, a developmental mm -hmm. delay, mm -hmm. um, you may get stuck in a stream where you're working on a lot of life skills, which mm -hmm. a lot of our kids require. Mm -hmm. And I hear a lot of parents talking about um, their frustration. And I, I think I this is my worst fear of, of my son not being able to access the academic stream when so many of our kids are really bright mm -hmm. super bright mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and while they may need life skills they may need social skills they may need lots of other practice mm -hmm. they get trapped in a world that is not satisfying for them intellectually mm -hmm. is is that is that the case yep it, it it really is and there's there's a number of things that start to happen to to funnel kids into streams as they get closer to high school and, and as they as they start high school um, and and so I mean for for me the the first consideration was okay where which high school which one has the best program and this is where you have to do your your shopping in, in your local area and go around and look at programs and school boards don't make it easy for you to find out what programs are available at what school um, and this is where you know, so much of what we see on our Facebook group is like, okay, who knows where there's a good program in such and such district or in this city. Um, and I would encourage members to continue to do that because sometimes it's information that we can only get from each other. Mm -hmm. um, but then once you're in and you started high school, um, there's the, the, the sort of different levels of courses, right? So there's academic, there's applied, and there's workplace. And then there's also locally developed. Um, and some of those um, locally developed and, um, courses don't count for credits towards a high school diploma. Mm -hmm. um, and once you start getting streamed into those courses, you're decreasing your child's chance of, of getting a diploma. Now, some of us have, like, we, we have different types of kids. 
and we have kids that change over time. I mean, our, our experience in our family was autism plus puberty equals, whoa. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> whoa, whoa Nelly. And yep. so the behaviors spike and all of a sudden it's not about, is my kid getting an 80 in math? It's about, can my kid go through the day without throwing a chair across the room? Right? Yeah. So we're focused on behavior. And unfortunately, what, what happened in, in our situation was the more the behavior spiked, the more the school system responded by decreasing the academic demands. Mm -hmm. And by saying, wait, 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 no, you've got to come out of the mainstream classroom. And then all of a sudden we're in what's called a section 23 class where the focus is on treatment. And that's absolutely where my kiddo needed to be mm -hmm. for a little while. Mm -hmm. But getting out of that placement and back into the mainstream, holy uphill battle, Batman. Yeah. And it's, and it's kind of a miracle that he did it. Um, but you, you have to sort of watch as your kid moves through the, the journey and then also decide sort of what your, what your aspirations are, what your expectations are. And, you know, there was definitely a point in, in, in all of this where I was like, you know, if he doesn't get a diploma, it's okay. I just want him to, you know, to be get some life enough. skills, be safe that's and all of that. Quite, that's quite a choice But it's to hard make. to let go of that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I, I, I can't say to any parent how they should go about making yeah. that decision. It's, it's really as you Louisa. go. Louisa. What is the Federation's perspective on Ooh. allowing ABA therapists into the classroom for observation and problem solving? Mm. Our school board is apparently only allowing this for life skills classes Ooh. just to put pressure on parents to put their kids Holy in crap. life skills rather than academic courses. Ooh. So we have a boy or a girl who's uh, having a hard time with their behavior um in an academic class we can't get that support mm. what's what's up with that yeah so i mean the second part of that question i i, I couldn't speak to with any authority because there you have a school board decision and yeah. and we're not the school board so, yeah. right? so right. so that's a yeah that's a board or an administration decision and and why they've gone down that road i, I you know I, that that's really hard to to figure out yeah. Our perspective on on having ABA therapists in the classroom is there should be every kind of support that a student needs in the classroom. We're convinced that the best way for that to happen is for those uh, for for those people who provide that support to be school board employees. Mm -hmm. um, that the that the most stable way um, that students are going to have constant regular access to to whatever kind of professional mm -hmm. support, if that's an ABA therapist, a speech language mm -hmm. pathologist, whoever it might be. If that's a board employed person, um, then you don't run into um, into the kind of difficulties you have when you start to privatize pieces of the system, mm -hmm. um, which they, they tend to become um, less reliable, less stable. Um, you are uh, you're siphoning off part of that money into, uh, you know, quite possibly into a, a profit making organization um, and and it just it just doesn't provide the same kind of absolutely reliable support that we would like to see which is to have all of those people there um, but we just we just think that they should be they should be school board employees in order for that to be a, um, a long-term sustainable way of providing mm -hmm. that support so how can we make that happen because we have well, this this has been a really interesting journey in yeah. in the advocacy work of, of the OAC because yeah when when we started um, applying pressure on education issues that was sort of how how i came in and it's it's funny walking into this building i remember the first time i came in i've got my little education report that we that we mm -hmm. produced back in 2017 and it mm -hmm. said we recommend that private eight um i what we called ibi therapists be allowed yeah. into schools and then i got some education <laughs> <laughs> about why that would be problematic and I, I mean, it, it's ironic that we're now at this point where there's a whole bunch of, of ABA therapists who are out of work. Um, I'd love it if the school boards hired them. Um, but the other th factor that, that's in the background in all of this is the ongoing lack of regulation of ABA therapists. 
So how can a union or a school board say in good conscience, sure, therapists from the community, come inside, work with these vulnerable at-risk youth. Um, oh, you're not a regulated profession? Sh oh, okay, sure. And then the other, the other thing, and this, this is where I start to wax a little philosophical, so I apologize in advance, but even regulated professionals that are employed by the school boards now, like psychologists and speech therapists mm -hmm. and, um, and, and support work for, for hearing impaired students, right now, A, there's not nearly enough of them, and B, they're largely prevented from working directly with students in the classroom. They can come in, they can observe, mm -hmm. they can make recommendations, which they then drop off on the teacher's desk or the principal's desk in the form of a report, and then they scoot back out of there. And this is true of our autism teams as well that are employed by boards. Mm -hmm. Lots of boards have started to hire BCBAs, but they go in, they observe, they write a report, and then they're gone. And for, for me as a mom, um, that's not helpful. <laughs> for my mm -hmm. kid, that's not helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and ironically, none of the reports are accompanied with a big bag of money with which to go out and purchase, say, sensory equipment or, or computer programs or assistive mm -hmm. technology mm -hmm. to then use with the kid. Yeah. So I, I, there's the rub, I think, for a lot of parents, right? Yeah. So we've got the OAP publicly funded. It's all public money. And then we've got the Board of Education, all public money. Mm -hmm. Why can't we munch? Why can't we get rid of these silos? Yeah. Why can't we set up these two professions so that teachers and ABA therapists become colleagues, which we know they will be. Yeah. We, we know that once they start working together, they will become colleagues. And yeah. wow, will it ever help the kids, you know? So here we are just lowly parents going, well, can't somebody do something about this? We talked a lot about regulation mm -hmm. with Louis Bush and Nancy Marchese at another Facebook Live, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, also with Lolly Herman, mm -hmm. and she talked a lot about regulation and also how, why therapists are not teachers and vice versa. Mm -hmm. It was a very, very good discussion for those of you who want to check it out. Uh, come on, Harvey, fix this for us. <laughs> I will. I will certainly join you in advocating for those kind of supports. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, we we do. We have. Um, my, um, you know, uh, my teacher members uh, in classes that don't have adequate supports for, for kids um, would love to have them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, my what's, what's that like for teachers when when uh, they have children with speci specialities, special exceptionalities, exceptionalities. Thank you very much. I see. I'm the pretty one yeah. here. <laughs> exceptionalities. <laughs> <laughs> you are gorgeous. You are gorgeous. <laughs> you know what? What is that like? Uh, we we hear story after story after story of kids just imploding. Yep. You know they are they are having a really rough time, and 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 more and more we in the OAC feel like we're on the tip of a tidal wave, mm -hmm. where the canaries in the coal mine. Yep, yep. You know. And uh, more good news to come, <laughs> you know. Stay tuned. So well, what's that like for a teacher whose so we're, whole job is to help we're, kids? We're in midstream in a policy change right now around around inclusive classrooms, right? I mean, um, it, it was an idea whose time had largely come, you know, like I'll, mm -hmm. I'll agree that there were there were kids excluded from regular classrooms who ought never to have been excluded, but that's the way society was. Um, there was a change around around that understanding, um, and now there's much greater inclusion. But the the supports haven't haven't caught up to that. Yeah. Um, in a lot of cases, um, you know, in my case, in that one class where I had the mm -hmm. the one uh, autistic student with a very very fine EA, it was it was Perfect. things things were great. Mm -hmm. um, but but in in so many cases, it hasn't caught up. My members, I can tell you, nothing. Um, nothing gets them more active than the desire to do their jobs well and they push the union to bargain on behalf of their of their you know of that desire um so so if you want to if you want to get um my members support staff and teachers riled up it's it's to interfere with their ability to do their jobs well and that's when they become most active and that's when they push their union to try to bargain on behalf of their ability so i have teacher members who ask us to bargain for more support staff 
um, that, you know, that, that is, is their biggest concern. Mm -hmm. um, if when, you, when you're in front of a classroom of kids and you can't do everything that you believe um, would be best for them, then that's a frustrating, difficult experience to go in day after day and to see a kid who, who um, needs more attention, who you know perhaps is on the verge of meltdown or explosion because they're not getting the support they need. That wears on an individual, right? Yeah. And, you know, yeah. and and so they they ask us to support them in doing the best job they can. And I think that's not something that people generally understand as as the union's role. Mm -hmm. um, but I can guarantee you, absolutely, it's what my members press us to do on a constant basis. Mm -hmm. And we, we take, um, in, in my board, we take a, a survey every year where our local um, district asks us, okay, we're heading into the next round of bargaining. Here are all the things that, um, that we might be bargaining for. Um, rank them in priority order. And so that's one of the ways that members communicate to the union, like these are the things that we want you to really go to bat for at, at, at the negotiating table. But, but to come back to the point about like other professionals in, in the classroom, I mean, I, I think, I, I, I'll speak for myself, I'm probably speaking for one or two other teachers when I say there's this feeling in the profession right now that we're constantly being asked to do more and more and more things. And that we, every year we have to get trained on more and more and more things. Mm -hmm. So I have to... Are you going to get a half day on autism? Oh, awesome. Yeah, you're getting that. Oh, well, problem solved. Yeah. Okay, we can all go home now. Bye. Yeah. Wait a second. Online, right? Right? Yeah. So every year I'm trained on how to use an EpiPen. I'm trained on human rights law. I'm trained on health and safety stuff. Um, I'm now trained on concussion protocols. I have to be sensitive to students' mental health needs. I have to be um, more educated about vaping in high schools now. Like, and, and, and the list just keeps getting longer and longer and longer. And I keep thinking, I don't know, a lot in the last year about that expression about how it takes a village to raise a child. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, come into my classroom and it's me and the village. Yeah. <laughs> and I need some more guys and girls and I want, I want the other members of the village to come in. I want my classroom to be a place where, where professionals like speech pathologists and behavior therapists and occupational therapists can come and go as needed. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't feel threatened by them coming into the space. And that if they want to take a kid over to the corner and sit with them, it's fine. Like, I can't think of a teacher in this province who would say, please do not send anybody into my room to help. I mean, there might be a few, but yeah. But but all of us are like, yes, please send more people in and let them actively engage. And that's that's something that I've been talking to, to Harvey about and, and other people in, in different federations. Of like, how do we move to a system where it's no longer the teacher has to be all things to all kids? Because I can't be a specialist on all of the things. Mm -hmm. I'm a generalist. And then, oh, yeah, I'm also supposed to teach a curriculum. Mm -hmm. hmm. It's hard. What about turf? I, I can, uh, an SLP told me a story one time, um, and she's, she'd just come out of grad school, ready to go, gung-ho, and she was brought into a classroom to assess a boy, mm -hmm. and he was on the top shelf of a bookshelf, Fantastic. you know, and like she's like, hat. assess him, you know? <laughs> assess him, I can't get him down, <laughs> right, you know, and this boy and the teacher, uh -oh. They were not getting along, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And um, the SLP, who's who's a fairly wise person, um, asked the teacher, "How can I help? What do you need this boy, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to do?" Mm -hmm. And she said, "He won't stand for the national anthem, right?" Oh God, that's actually one of my you know, worst fears. You know, <laughs> you, won't do, you know, and and of course, as the mom, I'm going cares i know who cares yeah you know uh and it's a perfect example of it's not just turf but adult <coughs> priorities versus needs of the kid yeah you know and when we have so few it seems like now we have this consultative process mm -hmm. where you can have somebody pop in and say to the teacher do this do this and do this goodbye you know and they get a sheet out of their their drawer and here you go yeah. you know uh and how do we fix that? 
can we fix that when we, I know it's funding and I know all that, but this, this, this sense of turf, like a therapist is not a teacher, a teacher is not a therapist. How do we get people collaborating? Oh, How do we look set at this. that up? Jen saying, oh, my son would dance around the room during the national anthem and his angel of a teacher would join him. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. To, I, I don't know about, about you, but to me, that, that's just a reflection of individual teacher personality. Yeah. Right. And, and individual style. And and what's I mean, when I came into the profession, I was very much about operational control in the classroom. I need classroom management. I need to have discipline. They must stand for the anthem. They must tuck their shirts in, take their hats off. And it's all about control. And some teachers never really leave that mode. Right. It's it's about order and control. And when you have a kid like ours, waltz into that environment and climb up on a bookshelf. Some teachers are, are going to be open minded to setting reasonable expectations for that child and and others may be less so. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm not saying that one is one is right and one is inherently wrong, but there's different levels of flexibility because teachers at the end of the day are just human beings. Right. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I, I, also, I don't I don't think that a teacher winds up that strict or, or that rigid by accident, you know, like what's the history of that teacher? What else have they gone through? Um, you know, do they have family in this, in the, the service, in the armed forces? And that's just really personally important to them that the students show that respect. Um, do they have no context or no understanding of autism and might not understand that that particular version of the anthem that's playing through the tinny PA system has some notes that hit some frequencies the trigger sensory problems in the kid and that might be totally outside their experience yeah it's, right? it's complicated and i think turf to the extent that you're talking about about specialties isn't a bad thing so mm. a teacher has a role an slp has a role a ea has a role whoever it might be in that classroom and they shouldn't be doing each other's jobs i mean i certainly couldn't do a speech language pathologist job um so to that extent mm. um I, I think that's part of what uh, what laura was saying mm. earlier about um, you know, teachers not wanting to take on roles that don't properly belong to them and shouldn't and and couldn't be asked to do a good job at it when that's not their training. Mm -hmm. um, so so uh, there should be all different kinds of support in the classroom, but each one should properly engage in the support that they're trained to provide. Yeah. Um, you're going to plug your ears for a second okay. while I take a, a question here from Jesse. Um, I tried to get my therapist to help the teacher and it was a no-go from the principal, always the excuse of privacy. But if that's the case, why are volunteers allowed? Um, so this is me speaking not as a member of OSSTF and not as a teacher. This is me speaking to you as a parent and as president of the OAC. Um, don't tell them that it's a therapist. Ask if, um, or, or yeah, just plug your ears. La, 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 la. See, the thing is, some, some principals are, are much more open um, to therapists in the classroom than, than others. But one of the workarounds that I've seen some of our members do is um, get that therapist in there to sign up as a volunteer. Get them to do the criminal background check, the vulnerable sector check, and say, I would like to volunteer um, and, and see if you can direct them to that particular classroom. Mm -hmm. The thing, though, about volunteers is that they have to be willing to volunteer to help all of the students in the class, not just one. But that's um, one unofficial workaround that you definitely mm -hmm. did not hear from me. And these are some of the measures that <laughs> like the parents so are, are. are needing to go to because they're so desperate to keep their kid in school mm -hmm. and, and not, not have them miss out uh, for potentially years. <laughs> and, and, you know? and I may have heard a little bit of what Laura said yeah. accidentally. Accidentally. And, and I'll, I'll say this. Look, we, we have policies and we have strong beliefs in what ultimately is good for the system in the long term. And, and when I say yeah. good for the system, I mean good for the kids in it. Yeah. Um, am I going to put myself in a position to criticize an individual parent who takes a step in order to, to uh, defend, protect, advance the interests of their kid? And that's a, that's a whole different matter. And, and mm -hmm. people have, you know, the individual uh, decisions of conscience that come with being a parent. And I, and I, I you know, um, there's no upside in, in mm -hmm. criticizing a parent uh, 
for for making those kinds of decisions it's mm -hmm. not my it's not my intent to and yeah. i have Sometimes children of my own and and, uh, <laughs> and i understand that completely yeah. i will say if you're putting in place stopgap measures to to support your kid mm -hmm. if you can also find the time to support policy measures that will in the long term yes. be better for all students then I would advocate for that too. Well, this this is so much of, of what we go through as, as parents. It's like, we, we can't advocate for anybody else until our kid is okay. If our kid's in crisis, then we can't go to protests, we can't go to meetings, we can't write letters, we can't yeah. do media interviews. We gotta look after our own kiddo first, and that's like a first principle in our organization. It's like, do what you gotta do for your- yeah. What you can, when you can. What you can, when you can. Yeah. Um, just before it flies off the, the page, someone is asking, I don't know the answer to this, is there a cap on the number of kids in a special needs classroom? How are oh, those numbers? Good question. Depends. Set? Yeah, it depends on the. I think the 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 short answer is essentially yes. Um, under the Education Act, there are um, identified special needs that have different kinds of caps on okay. the class sizes. Um, it, yeah, you'll find them in the Education Act for the most part. Maria, are asks, they always helpful? No, yeah. uh -huh. um, but do they help to limit the sizes of some classes? Yes. Mm -hmm. Maria asks, what programs exist for autistic kids who have more needs so they can attend high school? What supports are in place for them? Are there EAs or support staff for other mm -hmm. autistic students who do not have intense needs? Uh, <laughs> it depends on the school and it depends on the board. And again, I think the most frustrating thing about being a special needs parent is that there is often, there's no central place like, oh, I don't know, the board website where you can mm -hmm. go and find out all of the programs that are available at all of the different schools in your board. Mm -hmm. David, what did David Lepofsky say about David that? David always says this is like going into a restaurant and being asked to order, but they refuse to give you a menu. Yeah. So like you, I have no idea what I want. What do you have? We're not telling you. <laughs> 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 okay, I'd, yeah. uh, I'd like... It's, it's like a sci-fi movie. It's so surreal. It really is. Um, and that's why David pushes so hard for an Education Accessibility Standards Act, because that would be sort of like the minimum thing that we would put like on the floor of, of, of such a program, which is like, there needs to be a list, year to year, changing if necessary, depending on local needs and funding and all of that, but what programs are running at what schools. Um, on, on a practical level, the only way that I was able to find out for, for our son um, was just to refuse to sign the IPRC until they brought me another option. And IPRC is? An Individual Placement and Review Committee. It's a meeting that takes place to decide what type of placement a kid will have, a, an exceptional student. And there are only five options. Then the trick is finding out what the programs look like for each of those five options, which schools they're offered in. Um, and so when we were looking at, um, at, at trying to, to get our son out of a mainstream classroom and into something that was better suited to deal with the behavioral challenges, um, they kept bringing us ridiculous options. I'm like, oh, we found a perfect program for you. It's over at this school. And I'm like, great, okay, can I call the teacher or can I call the, the principal of the school? Like, you always have to go and look mm -hmm. at the school and do what I call the sniff test. Yeah. Um, we should mention that we shared a lot of details about yeah. Laura's past with exclusions yeah. on another Facebook Live, and they're all on our YouTube channel, but it's, um, it's, it's very it's handy. Story. It's a yeah. very long and complicated story. Uh, and um, thank you for sharing that. And for, I think a and lot of people- Thank you for stopping me from resharing yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's but, but that's the, why I'm here. The, the TLDR yeah. version is the way you find out what other programs are available is if they bring you an option that you're like, nope, that sucks, you refuse to sign the RPRC. And you say, bring me another one. Yeah. But- Easier said than done. Easier said than done. Yeah. And if you refuse one placement and you don't like the second one- I just can't- You know can't one. go back to the first one. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, that's okay. So I mean, I, puts, I won't turn down. You know, the shifting sand for the parent. Like, how unfair is that? How the hell are we supposed to navigate Life's this unfair. system? Life's unfair. Life's uh, unfair. Okay. okay. Moving on. Here's a, <sighs> here's a tough one. Okay. Okay. Anonymous. Uh, um, 
I know a little bit more about this story, so I can fill you in if, if you if you need it. Mm. I am a teacher. I am afraid to share my name. I witnessed okay. an incident where a colleague of mine was badly hurt by a student. Uh, this, this student was an autistic person. Uh, I feel helpless. I obviously care for my colleague, and we all know that the student was overwhelmed. Mm. Our school does not have enough supports to proactively circumvent incidents. I have my hands tied as I fear repercussions from my employer if I speak out. So this is a tough one. We, 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 we deal with the good, the bad, and the ugly mm. as moms. Um, and uh, it's, it is, we have talked about a viol violence a lot in mm -hmm. our Facebook Live conversations. It's a really hard subject. Uh, and uh, we at the OAC are not about throwing people under the bus, but these things happen. Uh, those of us who are parenting the children, we know that when our kids really erupt, yeah. it's usually because they've been set up to fail. Mm -hmm. You know, it's usually environmental, mom blew it, teacher blew it. Like we all, we're not perfect. You Sometimes know? it's random. Sometimes, too, right? yeah. It, it, it's like there's a supply teacher. Our children are complex, <laughs> complex people, yeah. right? So, a t uh, what did, but, I mean, why, what why she... is this teacher afraid to ask for more supports? Mm. Yeah, I, I, I don't understand that. I do understand um, that my members frequently feel like they are being um, dissuaded from reporting violent incidents. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Frequently, school level administrators seem to try to prevent the reporting of violent incidents because uh, they feel it reflects badly on their school or their their mm. management of the school. And therefore, mm. it's better to pretend it's not happening than to identify it um, and deal with it. So when we surveyed every, our members and said, how many times have you had a, a, a vice principal principal tell you not to report that even when you know it was a violent incident, the numbers were shockingly shockingly mm -hmm. high um yeah. you know could it could a school board you know she uh, i say she i'm not sure it's identified it's uh, she. i will i will I, not reveal yeah no I, <laughs> this, this, teacher. This, this teacher there are repercussions i mean uh by and large we can we can defend people from repercussions depending on on what they are if they're just uh you know, if they're if they're things like like I'm going to give you a lousy timetable, and sometimes those those sorts of things will will happen. Yeah. Um, but you know, here you have a case which seems to be quite clearly uh, insufficient support. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's sympathy here for the colleague, which is entirely appropriate because uh, when you're injured, the injury you know hurts the same whether it was deliberate or or not. But there's sympathy for the student as well. An overwhelmed the student was was clearly overwhelmed, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so this isn't about about culpability, um, other than perhaps for those who aren't providing the supports that need to be mm -hmm. there. We we have this conversation with QP members mm -hmm. as well, uh, and um, what they told me is that their members are discouraged oh, from that's... report reporting incidents. Uh, and getting to the bottom of things. Um, it seems... Is, isn't this one of those those moments, though, where like this is exactly the moment when you need to go to your federation yeah. yes. and call your district office and say, this happened, and this is how the administration at our school responded. This is how I'm feeling. This is what I'm afraid of. Can you help me? Like, yeah. our are district offices set up to field those kinds of calls? Absolutely, mm -hmm. and, do, okay. and do on a regular, regular basis. The, one of the most difficult calls you get, though, is the one that says, you know, this happened, but but you can't use my name. I don't want to rock the boat. And you, you can always say, like, we don't have a magic wand to fix these things. If I can, I you know, identify the circumstance and the individual, um, I can go in. And when I worked in my local office, that was part of the work that I did was supporting individuals with those sorts of things. Um, where you have that level of fear that they won't identify themselves, mm -hmm. your, your, your hands are tied. Yeah. Um, the, the other strategy that I, I would recommend here, and tell me if you, you agree with me, but if, you know, if there's a need to go and approach the administration of, of the school and say, look, we're not satisfied with your handling of this incident, I would go to the, the union representative at my school 
and say, please come with me to that meeting. Like to me, if the, if I mean, if there's even a, 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 a whiff of a concern that I'm in any kind of trouble or that I may be reprimanded or that I'm on any kind of shaky territory, um, like I go in and talk to my principal and my vice principals all the time. Most of the time it's fine. But on those occasions where I'm nervous, I take my federation rep with me. I do not go into those meetings alone. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what they're there for. Mm -hmm. right? To make sure that you're not treated arbitrarily in some way um, by, you know, because you brought a completely legitimate complaint, but it irritates the administrator that they have to deal with it, right? And want to take it out on you. We yeah. Can, we, we're, we are appropriately the buffer and the insulation and those sorts of circumstances. Mm -hmm. What happens uh, if uh, an EA or a teacher comes to the union for help, there's been an incident, they want to, you know, they want to talk about it, they want to resolve it, they want to help the student. What's the process like? Uh, depends on the nature of the problem, but I, if it's a safety concern, there are steps that are in place for, for um, putting a safety plan in place, for example, to ensure that, uh, try to ensure that a similar sort of thing doesn't happen again. Um, you can, you know, where, where safety concerns arise repeatedly, certainly the union can help you with getting somebody from the Minister of Labor, a safety inspector come in, and, and uh, in some cases they write orders that say, these, these things need to be put in place um, in order to, uh, to keep workers safe. We've been engaged in this issue um, really seriously for a number of years now because it was the single biggest issue our members were bringing to us was their concern about, about violence in their classrooms, um, mm -hmm. the injuries that they, were, that they were suffering. We had some luck working with um, the Ministry of both Education and Labor in terms of changing some things. Mm -hmm. um, we, but it, it hasn't gone nearly far enough. Um, I've been trying to reach out um, through the Ontario Public School Boards Association to say, um, we've done some of the high level work, now let's get right into the detail level. Mm -hmm. let's, get, let's get the union working with the school board, with a couple of volunteer school boards, mm -hmm. um, to get into a really detailed discussion about how we can support students and make sure that my members aren't coming home injured at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Um, and the uptake so far has frankly been a little bit disappointing. Um, mm. And I have one school board that I'm, I'm very uh, pleased has stepped forward in a significant way. Um, Which school board? You know, I. Well, tell us. He can. Ah! No, but I'll, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure I want to right now. We're, we're in early stages, but okay. I. I, I um, they, they deserve, they, and ultimately they will deserve credit for having stepped okay. forward. Okay, yeah. so what are the good signs that you're seeing? Just a willingness from, from the highest level, from the level of director to engage with us to say, yeah, I'll put together a team on my side, which will include um, people from their human resources department, will include you know, senior uh, superintendents, um, people from uh, health and safety, We'll include our local union leaders. It's a board in which we represent multiple bargaining units, so teachers and various kinds of support staff. Um, we'll bring in expertise from our provincial union office, and we'll sit down together and say, not just on a high level, what are sort of the policy reporting changes that we need to put in place, but what happened in this circumstance? How could we have done better? Mm -hmm. um, what will we do better next time and really get into that kind of detailed work? I, I think ultimately that's the only way we're going to get our hands around this mm -hmm. and try to, to make things better in the long run. And that'll be better for, for you know, educators, for workers in those schools. It's going to be better for kids too, mm -hmm. right? When you, can, when you can prevent, defuse uh, to a greater extent. Hey, 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 Harvey, how could parents partner with that process? How could they become part of the conversation and how could students who are able to advocate for themselves and talk about their experience how could they insert themselves into these meetings and, and discussions so so let's what i need first is is a few more and i, I don't want a large number we just we just need a few um you know to to get this going I need some school boards that are willing to partner with us Ooh. on this. Okay. That's that's really step one. So okay. I have one right now, and it's and it's you know we're just starting, mm -hmm. um, but I would like parents to talk to their trustees to say, would your school board be willing to step up and engage in this project with people who who ultimately want the same outcome? Because does this project because, have a name? 
No, no. Or, or how, how would a parent describe it if they were to call their trustee? They're like, I want my school, I want the school board to participate in the... They could ask, what? Is, is your school board willing to participate with OSSTF in trying to uh, address uh, violent incidents? Mm -hmm. Laura, quickly, what is a school trustee? So a, a school trustee is a locally elected official who is there, as I understand it, to, to sort of help conversations between, um, between parents and sometimes students and school board officials. Um, and they meet on a regular basis, they have minutes that are published, they have subcommittees that look at different things like the special education, what's SEAC stand for? Special Education Advisory, Advisory Committee, SEAC. Mm -hmm. um, all of those are, are involved in, in trustees. And then what's the role of trustees during contract negotiations? So the, I've never been clear on that. <laughs> yeah, the board of trustees is like a, is like a board of directors. And they, oh, okay. they, they really officially are there to, to um, set policy and direction. Um, and then the board employees from the director on down are there to implement. Now, it gets murky now because a lot of the policy comes out of the ministry and so forth, but yeah. still the trustees are meant to be, they are that elected body that's responsible to the electorate mm -hmm. that are supposed to set the direction for a school board with, with the hired uh, school board um, officials being there to implement those things. So what kinds of things do they vote on? Um, is it mostly well, school board policy type stuff? It will absolutely be school board policy. Do they um, ever vote on contracts? So are they, they are will they part of the negotiation process. They should be there to. They should. Um, they should set the mandate for the negotiating team for the okay. board negotiating team to say these are the parameters you're working within, and in the end, they sh they will be the ones that ratify a collective agreement. So it comes back to the board. Okay. On our side, one per member vote to ratify right. an agreement, and at the same time, um, the trustees then the trustees ratify will, well. will ratify as well. What trustees <laughs> aren't supposed yeah. to do is is engage in the day-to-day -day operations of the right. board. They're meant to be that high level. Mm -hmm. You know, the description of, of these boards of directors is is nose in, hands out, right? So they're supposed to have... <laughs> I haven't heard that yeah, before. I like that. Right? Nose That's in, the, hands out. Yeah. Okay. So keep your okay. fingers off it, yeah. but have good oversight over what's happening. Exactly. Okay. So as the mom of the nine-year-old listening to you two smart people, yeah. all I can think of is that these are big wheels. Yeah, they really are. That are big, moving wheels. very, very slowly. Ooh. And the earth in our community yeah. is stark yeah really you know is. we are having incident after incident after incident mm -hmm. we are having parents and teachers and principals pointing fingers we have principals who are afraid of parents we have teachers mm -hmm. who are afraid of parents um, I find it all bizarre parents, and, afraid of teachers. parents who are afraid of <laughs> teachers I, I find it all weird okay. yeah, it is. I really find weird. it all weird 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 for me, if there's a problem, just talk to me. Yeah. Just tell me what it is. My child is not able to communicate what has happened, so I want to know. I have a kid in distress. Mm -hmm. I have a kid who has to recover from these incidents. You know, for mm -hmm. us, it's, for grown-ups, we don't like it, but for the children, sometimes these it's incidents trauma. are are traumatizing. Yeah. And if it's happening again and again and day after day after kids day, being restrained, if the kids being excluded, yeah. if the kids being segregated in you know, a separate room. Of, so, how do we expedite things? How oh do boy. we how do we light a fire <laughs> under people who are decision makers and get them to understand? For God's sake! <laughs> I know. Carol, this, this this is the hardest thing in in terms of individual advocacy work for for a parent because the sweet spot that you're aiming for is on the one hand you need to be that really loud squeaky wheel that says urgent now mm -hmm. but if you come in too aggressive then you get principals and teachers and 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 everybody involved in the system going whoa crazy parents yeah do not, and they shut down and they shut off communication. So the, the way that, that Bruce and I used to play it was we literally went to meetings and we decided who was gonna play good cop and who was gonna play bad cop. Now, what a privilege to have both of us engaged and able to go to these meetings and still be together. I, I recognize that's not, that's not it. Um, but we, we had fun with it. We would flip too. Like usually I was good cop, but every once in a while, 
I would be bad cop and they would just not know what to do. And then there was the meeting where we both went as bad cop and we took pillows with us because we expected that it would be a long meeting. And we said that we refused to leave until we had a particular decision made. <laughs> so we showed up, we put our pillows down. And, but when you have to be assertive like that, not aggressive, when you have to be assertive, um, a little bit of humanity goes a long way. Always, oh, guys, this is such a simple thing to win teachers and principals over. But for the love of God, always bring coffee. Always. Bourbon. That's that's what I give um, at the end of uh, oh, the first term, term and okay. the end of second term. Okay. I literally used, okay, <laughs> never mind. Never I can't mind. even tell you what I used to do. But let's just say that, they, that the kids, the people who teach my kids, they get a choice between a Tim Hortons gift card and another kind of gift card, right? Um, that that may have the initials LCBO on it. Um, so we're at an hour. Yeah. Um, and there's there are a lot of questions we oh didn't boy. get to a lot, and I apologize. Some of the questions I avoided, not because they weren't terrific questions, but because it's not Harvey's expertise. Yeah. You know, and um, and we want to talk talk about things that he can actually talk about, um, but. Uh, do you, is one popping out? Uh, pair, uh, well, one? I, I think the, the one, and I'm, I'm seeing some questions pop okay. up in the, in the feed as well. Everybody right now is freaking out about class size yeah. and mm -hmm. the changes to class size. Um, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the process of like from, from top to bottom. So what the ministry has announced in terms of class sizes, how that ripples down to the board, how that ripples down to the school, mm -hmm. and then how how is it that my guy can be in a math class that only has 13 kids but next year i expect my grade 11 grade 12 law classes to have like 38. So how does that work let me let, let, i hope i can give a fairly brief and coherent explanation of that right now please do hard yeah, i will do my best <laughs> right now for every 22 students a board is funded to hire a teacher okay a classroom teacher there are some other um, Guidance is a little bit separate. Library, if they are teacher librarians, a little bit separate. But in terms of classroom teachers, every time a board gets 22 students, they get funding to hire a teacher. What the ministry wants to do is change that to every time a board gets 28 students, they get to hire one teacher. That's a big jump. That's a loss of one quarter of the teaching staff in a school. If you're now dividing, instead of by 22, you're now dividing by 28, one quarter of the teaching staff goes out the door over a period of time is what they're planning and this to do. is what we're starting to hear now right and so along with that the board is expected to to maintain a class size average no higher than currently 22 mm -hmm. but it's an average mm. so if you have a class of 10 because either um kids who have needs that mean that a bigger class would be a problem or it's a it's a class that has um, equipment and machinery in it, a technology class that has to be smaller because of uh, because of safety issues. Then some other classes, you're just you know you're squeezing the balloon. It's going to come out somewhere. Some other classes are going to get mm -hmm. larger. What happens when you go to, to 28 to one is is either you lose the ability to offer those smaller classes, and those kids who need the smaller class for attention or safety or whatever, they will they won't have access to it or else some classes will balloon to literally 40 or 45 students in order to maintain that class of 10 or 12. Mm. The art class that, you know, not a lot of kids want potentially, but some are absolutely going to follow into their futures. Um, you know, I use the example of the senior physics class being very much the same in an average high school, 800 kids. How many kids are going to want to pursue grade 12 advanced level physics maybe not that many but those who do may be really pursuing that to, right into yeah. their career right those options are going to get cut off because what's happened one out of every four classes it's not just the teachers yeah. don't go by themselves they go with the six classes that they were teaching they leave mm -hmm. with those mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One, one out of every four classes is going to be gone under this proposal so when you talk about, um, you know, there was a question about about small, small, uh, you know, sort of academic level classes. For yeah. Kids. Yeah. Boards will no longer be in a position to offer those. Minister Thompson made. <laughs> sorry. No, Minister, sorry. <laughs> can you what? put this in terms of goats so okay. that we can explain uh, to the Minister of Education? Uh, sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, Minister Thompson did. She did stress mm -hmm. that they wanted to increase the instruction of mathematics mm -hmm. exponentially. It seems. 
so nothing, nothing so about what the minister is saying, in my opinion, makes sense. Okay. First of all, large classes don't lead to resiliency. <laughs> in fact, they lead to the opposite. They lead to meltdowns and breakdowns and, and kids who get insufficient attention. And, you know, maybe it's a kid having a meltdown or maybe it's the quiet kid in the back of the class oh. who, who doesn't call attention to mm -hmm. herself. But the teacher can only attend to if it's in a class that's small enough and find out what's going what's on, what's wrong, whether or not you're connecting, whether that kid is a day away from dropping out or worse, right? Yeah. Um, so so if you want to improve math instruction, you don't do it by jacking up class sizes to, to 40. If you want to give kids access to technology classes that might lead them into the skilled trades, you don't do it by eliminating those classes because you can't offer them anymore because they need to run at too small a class size. So I'm right. sorry, what the what the minister is saying um, just doesn't align with, with any reality, including the claim that they're just aligning average class size with, with uh, sort of the average in, in Canada. That's also not true. In fact, mm. what they're proposing is that we go from among the best, which is where we are now, to pretty much the bottom of the pile. Mm. That's where they want to take us, not to the middle, but to the bottom of the pile. What's the master plan? Here, Harvey. Like, what the the big question that I'm that I know I'm going to get a lot in the next couple of days because these cuts are are hitting the school where where I work, and and courses are literally going to be canceled tomorrow, and students are going to find out. The hardest question I get is why is the government doing this, Miss? What's their motivation? Like, what's their game plan? So, in some ways, I'm not sure that's you know that's it. It is their question to answer. Um, so yeah, we can course. only surmise. Um, but when you set a target of deficit reduction um, while at the same time um, cutting taxes, mm -hmm. the pie has shrunk and somehow the way you're going to meet that is by reducing the cost of it. You, you can't reduce um, costs uh, without going af after health care and education, the two biggest expenditures. And, the provincial budget. Um, and education is also, I will say, the most significant investment we make in our future. So when we go after these kinds of cuts, mm -hmm. we're also going after Ontario's future economy. We're, we're cutting our ability to do well in an internationally, globally competitive world. We will graduate fewer students from high school. Mm -hmm. Fewer students will go on to post-secondary. Right now, we graduate the most post-secondary, uh, on average, of any OECD country. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we're going to lose that. We're going to go back to the graduation rates that we had in the 90s, which mm -hmm. are in this, you know, around 60 something percent as opposed to the 86 percent we have right now. Um, and and so it's a short term cost cutting exercise that in the long run is going to cost the province. And isn't here's here's the biggest fear, I, I think, of, of those that are watching and will watch this later. Mm -hmm. Aren't the classes that our kids are in the small contain sometimes contained classes of, of, of special needs kids? Aren't they going to be an obvious target to like, will school boards want to try to shut those classes down in order to, to, to keep the average where, where they want it? Or how, so how's that just, dynamic? I'm going not to just going to speculate here. Okay. First of all, I would tell you that they are, um, you know, in, in, in deep jeopardy, those kinds of classes. How do I know that? Well, the Thames Valley School Board put out a memo uh, a couple of weeks ago called Best Practices in Staffing. They subsequently withdrew that memo because I think the uh, the optics weren't good for oh, them. Dear. But here's what they recommended. Do not offer any locally developed classes. Stop offering them. Why? Because they're small. Do, so um, for a second, what, what is a locally developed course mm -hmm. and what types of students usually take those? So you may actually know that better than I. I kind of, uh, yeah. I think you do, but you know, students with, with, uh, with special needs um, who, who, uh, have a low chance of success in a regular classroom and a regular academic classroom can be offered these smaller specialized programs. Right. Um, and they and they are small um, and and that's where kids get the attention and support that they need. They just stop offering those. So put those kids into a regular academic level classroom. What's going or an to happen? Applied class, or, or, or yeah, yeah uh, whatever, yeah. What's going to happen? Um, uh, they're going to crash and burn. Uh, crash and burn, including drop out as, at the at the earliest opportunity, um, because they're getting no no success uh, in in that kind of environment. So that's what they said. They also said um, this this staffing memo in Thames Valley said um, 
teach French only at the uh, at the academic or open level don't even have uh, applied level French because then you can have bigger classes. So it's just an example of where their solution, their so-called best mm -hmm. practice is to provide an education that's great for a certain kind of kid and just misses the mark entirely for a whole bunch of other kids. Their memo suggested that if you have one high school that's offering a program and another that isn't, set them up by video link so the kids in the other school could get videoed instruction. Um, that's that's a, a, a sad and pathetic amelioration How of a problem. How am I going to see when it's the kid puts up their hands? You, you, I'm going to be staring at the screen like yeah. this, which I can yeah. barely yeah. see now. So, so that, that class size issue should be deeply concerning um, for every parent. Um, it should be concerning for a parent uh, of, of a special needs kid, of a, of a kid on the autism spectrum. It should be concerning for anybody who relies on Ontario's high quality graduates um, and, and is a, you know, is a participant in and a driver of Ontario's economy that they're not going to have access to the same kinds of knowledgeable, skilled uh, employees that they have access to now. I this think is we should, depressing. Yeah. I think we should wind down. Uh, I'll, I'm just I'll let you, up. Yeah, we're just getting wound up. <laughs> um, an idea did pop into my head. We're, uh, next week, we're going we're to be talking to Sam Hammond, who mm -hmm. is the president of ETFO. We've already spoken to Fred Hahn. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder, I wonder if we could continue these conversations. The, I, the thought that came into my head was, is our public school system really for the public now? Well, it's not for everybody in the public. You know? And this is this is where I worry that the end game here is to to paraphrase a previous minister of education um, to create a crisis, mm -hmm. and then to suddenly say, oh, "I have an idea. Let's introduce charter schools, and then all the kids with autism could go to a special charter school just for kids with autism." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how many of us would, out of sheer desperation, jump at that? and then ultimately cause the, the deconstruction of, of public education. Mm -hmm. And I know we're bumping up against commercial break here, but I do have to put this in because what Laura's talking about, they're, they're proposing in a particular way right now with the requirement that every student um, in the future take four e-learning credits. Someone's going to make they're, money off they're that. They're talking about that being centralized. We don't even know where in the world that will be offered from. It's not necessarily Ontario or even Canada. This is very easily the offshoring of jobs where students will have to get their education through e-learning via computer, which some kids don't own and some kids can't get access to, um, to high-speed internet. Yeah. And lots of kids don't learn well when it's just, you know, when that's how they're getting their instruction as yeah. opposed to a real human being there supporting them. Yeah. That is step one in the in the privatization and offshoring of Ontario's education system, um, and it is and it, it, it is it is so deeply concerning that they are proposing ultimately the destruction of public education in this province. So, this is so depressing. Um, it, it, it's funny. I was in a classroom the other day where, on the the walls were not strangely union propaganda posters, as has been suggested by certain members of the government, but instead um, worksheets about um, the protagonists in dystopian novels and how they feel. And I was looking at them going, check, 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 check. Let's talk about hope and let's talk about resistance. What do we do? It's clear we need to fight. How do we fight and how do we build a movement, a partnership between parents and teachers and education workers and students and 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 what do you recommend that that parents do in their local communities to start to, to move in that direction? There are lots of things that we can do that we've been doing. There's a reason that we're talking mm -hmm. here. Um, yeah. <laughs> of course, we have 
we have ultimately the same interests. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've reached out to, to other allies as well. Mm -hmm. As you well know, we had a rally a few weeks ago that attracted uh, 30,000 people to Queen's Park. It was a, an astonishing success in that regard. But it was a, a success in terms of raising the issues because mm -hmm. what, what was being talked about there was, was ultimately how do we support students Mm -hmm. to, to reach the futures that are, you know, the, uh, and the that students are choose. organizing too, and right? And the students are absolutely organizing. Um, although I can promise you, we have not supported their their walkout, despite once again. You mean they're not union pawns? They're, they're, apparently, they are not. And oh. and I mean, you try telling a teenager what to do, right? Um, you know, you know, <laughs> I got that one goes. right over there. So uh, what? So <laughs> we're doing. We're talking about um, students as union pawns. We're doing all of these things, but you know what? Ultimately, the power is in the hands of the elected provincial government officials. They're the ones who can change the policy. And any politician who's nervous about not being, getting reelected is going to look carefully at the policy they're proposing. Mm. You need, everybody needs to contact their MPP, particularly if they are conservative MPPs, because that's the government right now, and say, if you go down this road, we will be unable to support you in the future. And that's, that's the, the key most, sentence. That's, if you do this, we will not vote for we you. We will not vote for you. That is the most powerful tool you have in a democracy. Are there some materials that you can help us with that you can send our way? Absolutely. Okay, yes. cool. All right. Yeah. And maybe stuff that we can cross post and we can put on the OAC website and, um, and we can share some materials with you too. Yeah. yeah, to the extent that you want to send people to our website, hereforstudents.ca, mm. and there's a mechanism in there where you can basically push a button and send a letter to your MPP. Mm -hmm. Oh, ontariostudents.ca. Oh. Hereforstudents.ca. Hereforstudents.ca. Okay. All right. And then there's also the online consultations. Do you want to talk a, a little bit and about that? And then we should stop because, we should. because yeah. we've been going um, for a while. So, yes, yeah, so the, 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 the provincial government is holding consultations on class size. Mm -hmm. um, you can... Find them. I, I I don't have that um, address right in front of me, but um, but I if can you can post it. Yeah, if you can want to post that that address, um, then people should participate in that and Ooh. express their concerns about large class sizes um, and the loss because it comes along with a loss of program. Yeah, that's the other half of it. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow, that was a lot. That was a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What okay. Eh? Eh? eh. eh. You like? Not eh? bad, eh? I like Kelly's suggestion. Hashtag. Autism parents for teachers, and flip it: teachers for autism That's parents, okay. teachers for autism students. Like it, that was my message at, at, at the rally. Was, you know, I, I think if if we if we as members of OSSTF and, and other unions try to make this whole thing about teacher jobs, that's definitely a part of the equation, but this really is about students and their learning and parents and students and teachers have to come together. Um, and if we do that, we'll be unstoppable. Um, so it's, it's about realizing, I mean, for me, the, the biggest challenge in, in the journey is, is sitting on, on both sides of the, of the teacher desk as a mom and as a teacher. Um, but recognizing that my kids' learning conditions are someone's working conditions. And it's just the same thing looked at from a different perspective. So mm -hmm. if we all want the same thing, we all have to, to push together in the same direction and, and support each other. And I can tell you the fact that we are collaborating is making certain people at Queen's Park very nervous. <laughs> I see you, Doug Ford. Okay, hey, thanks Harvey. My pleasure. Thanks, Laura. Okay. More, more, more another day. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah. We really appreciate yeah, I enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> Nailed it. Stay in the fight. Oh, she left me hanging. <laughs> oh, oh, there we go. I always leave her hanging. <laughs> okay. All right, guys. See ya. Goodbye. Thank you, everybody. Yep. There we go. Okay. So okay. then. You see, you got to, you have to I, click I will, on it. I will turn it okay, around. Turn it around. So, I don't Mom, know if we're still recording or not. Yeah. So don't say While you were doing that, I finished my <laughs> first paragraph of my English assignment, yeah, finished but, my okay. math work, Obviously. and wrote and, my and student and council application. Uh, I just think like showing Damn. connection <laughs> is really important for people to see. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was good, guys. Oh, you know, nope. and, and, I, I got to show you what we're saying earlier. What Mr. Really wrote.